So talking about your project presentations a little bit, there are two things that you're doing, okay? One of them is you're doing a project to present to me, to show me that you understand and are calculating the data correctly and using the data correctly, right? And that's different than what you're going to present to your client, okay? Because what you're going to show me is here's the information that we used, here's how we used it, here's how we calculated it, and here's what we know from it. Your client does not care how you calculated it, right? So when you're talking to me in, a, in your paper, you're going to show me the tables and you're going to walk me through step by step how you got your answers, right? When you're presenting to your client, you're presenting the overall information. You're not, you're not trying to show them, well, this is the, you know, this is this, this is this, this is this, and we multiplied this times this to get this, right? They don't care about that, right? They're going to assume that you got that right. You can talk about some of your assumptions if you want to, right? Include that in your client presentation. But just be aware that those are two different types of presentation. One is a technical one that you're providing to me so that I can see that you've calculated things correctly, and that's what your project paper is about. And then the PowerPoint that you're presenting to the client should be about the process that you used, right, but at a high level, not the detail nuts and bolts of we took this and multiplied it by this to get this. It doesn't matter to them, okay? Here's what we found in terms of waste. Here's, here's where we think your opportunities are, right? So you're presenting that bigger picture. So think about it. If you were them, what would you want to know so that you could, you know, work on improving that process, right? So does that make sense to you how those two are different? Okay, I get one nod, yes, two, three, four, okay, good, all right. So, and I say that because um, in previous semesters that seems to be a bit of a disconnect for students and that's why we do, you're gonna do your um, class presentation in here of your project on, uh, looks like, um, uh, we're gonna do that on November 29th, right after Thanksgiving, okay? And so you're going to come in and you're going to present like you're going to to your client. And then after that, where you're going to work with your client, set up a time to meet with your client. Okay? And I'll be there for that as well. But you practice it with this class, and, then, and we'll be able to give you some feedback about, yeah, that made sense, or no, it doesn't. right? Because we want you to have a professional and engaging presentation for your client. All right? Any questions about the project or about the, how the schedules change? All right. Um, so project B was due when? Last night? So did everybody get it submitted? No. No? I no. had, uh, there was something, racer mail or something wouldn't pull up. I couldn't get the emails off at my house. It was like 10.30 and I tried to like 11.30. I got pictures of what came up, but it said the server wouldn't because they had sent me all the parts to like put the numbers to and make all the math work since I knew what that did and I couldn't pull it up and open it and I was like I tried to 11 30 and I was like I'm going to bed all right so and where's your team at with it we're waiting to get uh, the actual timing like times from Susan okay. uh, because she said we could write map out the process and email it to her then she'd send us some feedback okay so when did you email her we last week yeah like, it was last week I think it was Friday. Okay, so I would say your team didn't have much of a shot at success if you wait until Friday to get that to her, right? Yeah. So I'm going to put a little pressure on your team, get your act together, and get ahead of the curve, okay. right? So, and then Hunter, just a little to you, don't wait till 11:30 on the night that it's oh, no. on it. So again, it isn't in this class. It's important to me that you get it and that you do the work. So it's not the end of the world. But the bottom line is, in comparison, you, you know. If you're in a professional environment, it's not acceptable, right? You all know that. So, um, but in this class, it's I would rather have you take the extra time and get it right than I would to have you. Well, let's just get something to submit. So. Yeah, like we met at six in the library, and then she had left. Kaylin had left her folder in uh, Mayfield, and she went back to Mayfield, and it's like, oh, I'll send it to you. Then I got it. I got the email. I just finally open up racing around I got the email at 1041 is when it went through but my I couldn't open it in my house I'll show you the pictures of what no, came and that's off. okay there was something going on with the internet last night yeah I tried to VPN into Murray State about 1030 last night and I would hit a key and it would go five seconds and then it would change well it said that like the racer mail server was like down for something it's I got a picture of it and I was like well I can't really do anything 
and I tried it like when she said she sent it to me at 1040 and then just kept trying to 1130 and it went open and I'm like I got three tests tomorrow I'm going to bed so 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 just my don't wait until the last minute that's and, oh, yeah. and you're you're coming up on the end of the project and there won't be any at the end of the semester there's no you know well let's hold that off for another week after you don't want that and I don't want that right no. I had a professor when I was working on my PhD that if and it was just the way he worked. You would have a paper that was due at the end of the semester, and he was never satisfied with it. There was no PhD student that he, he would give an incomplete to everybody until you finish the paper to his satisfaction. Like, we're not going to do that here, right? You guys are going to get it done and, and get it done accurately. So, and I think my concern is, in particular with your group, the relationship that we're trying to establish, or that I'm trying to establish with the HR group, I think they were really thinking you guys were going to be able to, to help them and deliver that. And so I, it's important to me that you guys are doing a good job. And so if you've got questions, you need to be sure to ask, okay? So um, make sure that you're on, on top of it from that standpoint. All right. Um, <clears throat> so that being said, um, we're going to keep going on with Chapter 5 today. Um, <clears throat> and Chapter 5 is about flow rate and capacity analysis. And if you remember what we talked about, we did just kind of the basics <coughs> on um, Thursday where we looked at if we just had one type of unit right, and how we would use that to calculate um, the, the efficiency and, and kind of move across. So we did um, the unit load, right, and then the effective capacity, right, and then the effective capacity of the pool, okay? And so <coughs> when we talk about um, those things today, what we're going to do is we're going to go, well, but oftentimes you're not dealing with just one type of unit Right? Sometimes you're, you've got a mix of things. You've got this product mix going on. And so today, and really in this class, we're just going to kind of focus on um, a, a pretty straightforward mix of two products. And what do we do when we've got a product mix? And one product takes longer to do than the other one. How do you, how do you then talk about your capacity? Okay? All right. All right, so, um, so for a process that produces several types of products at the same time, we can represent that overall flow of those various products by creating what we call an artificial flow unit, which represents the entire mix of the various products. Okay? So we can calculate the unit load of the mix by averaging the unit loads of the individual products using the weight of the mix. So you're using a weighted average. Everybody familiar with a weighted average? Okay. A weighted average is just when you say, um, I run two products down my line. I do one of them 80% of the time, and I do 20, another one 20% of the time, right? If one of them takes me, if the first one takes me one minute, I'm going to take 80% times one minute, and if the second one takes me two minutes, I'm going to take 20% times two minutes, and that's going to be my weighted average when I add those together, okay? And so that's really, as we start how we're going to do this artificial flow unit, that's the premise behind it, okay? So... Example 5-4 from your textbook um, says, currently New Life handles a product mix of 60% physicians claims and 40% hospital claims. So then we want to figure out what is the effective capacity of the process. Well, if you uh, look in the textbook, the, the information that comes from the textbook says, when I look at a unit load for the physician claim, right, the mailroom clerk spends one minute per claim, the data entry clerk spends five minutes per claim, claims processor eight minutes, claims supervisor two and a half. However, on the hospital claim, right, the mailroom clerk takes a little longer, the data entry clerk takes a little longer, the claims processor takes the same amount of time, and the claims supervisor takes longer. So what I end up doing is I take then, um, if we're saying it's a 60-40 unit load, I take 60% of one minute plus 40% of 1.5 minutes, right? And that gives me a 1.2 uh, unit load. Everybody see how we're coming up with the 1.2? So our artificial unit load for a mailroom clerk is 1.2 minutes per claim, okay? Courtney, you tracking that? Mm -hmm. Okay, Taylor? All right. So you're just doing that all the way down. So 5 times 60%, 6 times 40% is 540, and et cetera. Then, instead of using 
it's the exact same thing that we did on Thursday, except we're using the artificial unit load instead of the single product unit load. Okay, and so we plug that into our table, right? And so we have our unit load for our artificial unit, and then we get our effective capacity by taking the inverse of it, right? So 1 over 1.2 is 0.83, 1 over 5.4 is 0.19, 1 over 8 is 0.13, and 1 over 3.1 is 0.32, okay? Same process that we used on Thursday. How many resources <laughs> do we have in the pool? Right? And so to get the effective capacity of the resource pool, we take the number of resources times the effective capacity of a single resource unit. Okay? So 0.83 times 1, 0.19 times 8, et cetera. Okay? So um, do you see how this, so you should have finished your 5A homework, right, last night? Did you get that done? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all we're doing is instead of diving right into, okay, well, I've got a product, the, you have to put a step in front of it and say, I have to create an artificial unit load. And then the process is exactly the same as what you did on Thursday, what we did in class on Thursday, okay? Um, <clears throat> there'll be some, um, as we go through the, the homework problems, or we'll, we'll go through some practice problems here today, you'll see that we're gonna, we can ask some different questions, and depending on the question that's asked, maybe you need to go back and look at the unit load of a physician or the unit load of a hospital and separate that back out. So you have to kind of look at what types of questions you're being asked as well, okay? So, you know, a question we can ask ourselves is, can we determine which of the two claims processed is more profitable? And the answer to that is yes. Right? So to answer that question, we need to supplement the data on capacities for the two products with financial information concerning revenues and variable costs. Okay? So unit contribution margin of each flow unit is the revenue less all of its variable costs. So we're not concerned about fixed costs when we're talking about unit contribution margin. Okay? So for example, revenues for, for physician and hospital claims are 550 and 675 respectively. Okay? And variable costs are 50 cents and 75 cents. So then we can get our unit contribution margin by just subtracting out those variable costs from those revenues. Okay. So our question is, can we determine from this which is more profitable? Okay. If I look at this, which would you think would be more profitable? Uh, hospital claims. <laughs> right. You might make an assumption about that because its unit contribution margin is actually better. But what we're going to learn is that that isn't enough information, okay? You got to know how many they do. You got to, and you got to know how much time it takes them to do it, right? Yeah. So unit contribution margin of each flow unit is the revenue less all of its variable costs, right? And we have our effective capacity. We can say how many units per hour they're actually able to do. And so for a physician claim, our unit contribution is five dollars per claim, and we can go back to our um, initial. I think probably last Thursday's class, and their, their effective capacity was 60 units per hour. So that means the potential profit for physician claims is $300. On the other hand, the unit contribution margin for the hospital claims is higher, right? It's $6 per, per claim, but they can only do 40 an hour. So therefore, the potential profit per hour is 240 okay? So, yes? Does it tell you how many you can do per hour? Um, it's, you're going to come up with that from your capacity information. Okay. So that's how this all links together, right? You have to identify what the capacity is, and then you use that capacity to determine how much they can do per unit of time, okay? So as that example demonstrates, the relative criterion is determining profitability of products is not contribution margin per unit, but it's contribution margin per unit of time, okay? All right, so the next section that we talk about is capacity waste and theoretical capacity, okay? So things that drive capacity waste. If you're thinking about a process, if you're thinking about a production process, maybe your equipment breaks down, right? Maybe you have to go down regu for regularly scheduled maintenance. Maybe you have quality rejects. Maybe there's rework that needs to be done. The setups that happen between different product batches take time, right? And then you have some non-value adding activities. And so all of you, as you're starting to work on project B, are starting to think about those value adding and non-value adding activities, okay? Um, and so, um, so that's what can drive that waste, okay? 
So unit load is an aggregation given the way the resources are currently being utilized. That includes both the productive time and the wasted time. Okay? So if capacity waste is large, we may, we may want to look at turning our attention to eliminating that waste. And so we want to segregate that waste from the, um, out of the process. Right? We want to understand what that is. Okay? So as we think about that, we talk about to, to take that waste out, we think about theoretical unit load of a resource unit. So that's the minimum amount of time required to process a flow unit if all the waste were gone out of the process. Right? So you're looking at the step, So I, and I'll take it down to one of the rectangles on your diagram, an activity on your diagram, and it is going to have both value added things that need to be done and things that are waste. Right? And so now what you're going to do is you're going to identify specifically the time that is value added, that needs to be done. Okay? Um, and then you're going to identify the rest of it as waste. Okay? And so that's going to give you, if I'm evaluating a process and I have a step that has 85% waste in it, that's a clue, that's a place to go look for how can we improve this, right? how can we reduce that uh, down to where we're not at that high of a waste factor. Okay. So theoretical capacity of the resource unit is the reciprocal of the theoretical unit load. So it's just like what we're talking about with the regular unit load and capacity, only now you're talking about the theoretical unit load and the theoretical capacity. So it represents the maximum sustainable flow rate through the resource unit if it were to be utilized without any waste. So you're talking about the perfect world. And the reality is you're not going to achieve the perfect world but it gives you a place for comparison to say, okay, here's where we're at, here's what the perfect world looks like. If the gap is like this, right, there's a place to look. If the gap is like this, you probably don't have a lot of opportunity for improvement there, okay? And so that's why you're looking at those steps in that way, okay? The theoretical capacity represents a highly idealized and seldom attainable notion of capacity. Its usefulness derives from the fact that it estimates the waste in the systems and forms the basis for creating an action plan to eliminate that waste. Okay? So, um, example 5-6 from the text says, consider the operating room, which is we're going to call a resource unit of a hospital, which specializes in cataract surgery. On average, the hospital manages to perform a surgery every 30 minutes. So one surgery every 30 minutes. Okay? This is the unit load. Thus, the effective capacity is two cases per hour, right? And you can see if we're, we're talking about initially they were talking in minutes and we convert it to hours. So it's um, 0.5 of an hour, right, per surgery. And so our effective capacity is 1 over 0.5 or two surgeries per hour, okay? And we use one operating room. Uh, we have one operating room in the resource pool. And then you say, well, suppose it's estimated that 33% um, of the operating room time is wasted, cleaning, restocking, change, changeover of nursing staff, fixing malfunctioning equipment, and so on. Thus, the theoretical unit load can be estimated as 30 times 1 minus 0.33, right? So I'm going to go 30 times 1 minus my 0.33, and um, gives me 20 minutes, yielding a theoretical capacity of three cases per hour, okay? All right, your effective capacity is, your theoretical capacity utili utilization then is your, um, and I think it should say, and I'm just going to fix that real quick, it should say your theoretical effective capacity divided by 1 minus your capacity waste factor, okay? And your capacity waste factor, you know, this is where you're getting into the real world. It's not, there's no... There's no hard and fast, this is how you measure the waste factor, right? Sometimes it's going to be based on experience. Sometimes it's going to be based on things that you can see and measure, okay? Um, but it can be data-driven or it can be an estimate based on the amount of downtime that occurs in a process, right? You're going to use the, the people that are involved in the process are going to be able to tell you how often or how long they're down <coughs> or what, what that waste time is, okay? All right, so... That pretty well concludes the this part of the lecture. Did you have a question, Scotty? Yeah. Okay, so the point three three is that given to us? Yes. And well, in the problem it is, in your and your um We would get it projects, from our client. Yeah. Or you're gonna look at the process and go, this is the actual so we did a little bit of that with your project. We were talking about in a particular step, here's how much time they actually spend doing it. 
and then here's how much time it takes them to, to, to complete it. So the actual work takes this much, but the actual completion takes this much. So here's the non-waste, and then the rest of the waste. So then how do you get theoretical capacity again? So theoretical capacity um, is <coughs> the effective capacity I'm sorry. divided by 1 minus the capacity waste factor. So 2 divided by 1 minus 0.33. Yeah, so let's do that real quick just to make sure our math is tracking right. We're going to move into doing some practice problems, so I'm just going to go here. It should be, so we said it would be, um, the effective capacity was going to be 2 divided by 1 minus 0.33. Yeah. Yeah, so you get 2.99, basically. Okay. Okay. And we're going to go through some examples here in class, okay? Um, switch gears here for just a second. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save the discussion questions for uh, Thursday, and we're going to do the example problems. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start on those. If we have time at the end of class, I'm going to go ahead and walk through um, these uh, exercises. I think I'll save uh, five seven probably for Thursday. <laughs> so we'll do. I'm gonna do these today. And so I'm gonna go to the back of your textbook, not the back of your textbook, but the back of this chapter, right? And <clears throat> you'll notice that I t this this is how I typically set up these these problems. I try to do them in the same way every time. Okay, so if we're going to do problem 5-1 in the back of the text here, it says... <coughs> Are you going to put... You can put this on... I think it might be already. I'd have to look and see. What would it be under? It should be under the Chapter 5, Lecture 2 stuff. Is it there? Let me look. Okay. 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 Um, Would it be under Lecture 3 PowerPoint? No, I wouldn't think so. Um, give me a second. If it's not there, I'll put it out there real quick. Oh, that's a PowerPoint. Man. In the class chapter review. So I'll put the template out there. So here's the chapter five, and I'll put it un right underneath the chapter five lecture two. So if you want to open that, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, <clears throat> But here's the gist of it. So for 5.1, a law firm specializes in the issuance of insurance policies covering large commercial real estate projects. The project falls into two categories, shopping centers and medical complexes. The typical work involved in each transaction is quite predictable and repetitive, right? And for the month of November 2010, the firm has generated the 150 orders, 75 of each type. Assume one month equals 20 days, okay? 
And so right away, I'm hearing as I read that, I've got two different types of units, right? I've got a shopping unit and I've got a medical unit. Those are the two different types of insurance policies. Sorry, we're gonna go, not shopping, but commercial real estate, no, shopping funny. centers and medical. Okay, good, good, all right. And it tells us in the problem, right, that the unit load in terms of hours per contract for a paralegal is four for a shopping, one for the tax lawyer, and one for the senior partner, right? And the unit load for the medical um, in terms of hours per contract is six for the paralegal, three for the tax lawyer, and one for the senior partner, okay? And then it tells us the number of professionals, right? And so we've got four paralegals, three tax lawyers and two senior partners, right? And then it tells us something a little different that we haven't worked with before, but it makes sense because what we're saying is that these people aren't 100% dedicated to this. They have other things that they do. So how many hours available is that professional actually available? And so the paralegal is available for six hours a day, the tax lawyer is available for eight hours a day, and the senior partner is available for four hours per day. Okay, so now I've just, all I've done is taken the information that they provided us in the problem and transferred it into this table, okay? All right, and so <clears throat> the assumptions that we've got is we have 150 orders, right? And we're doing, and they tell us that we did 75 of each type, okay? So because we did 75 of each type, what's my artificial, how am I calculating my artificial unit load? Isn't it 50% for each? It's 50% for each, so basically I can, eliminate the weighted average stuff and just say it's the average, right? So the average of four and six is five, right? The average of one and three is two. The average of one and one is one. So now I've calculated my artificial unit load, okay? So then how do I move on from that into calculating my effective capacity of the resource unit? What am I doing here? Taylor, do you remember? The, the um, inverse, yeah. mm -hmm. so it's gonna be one over five. Right? So that gives me a resource capacity of 0.2 contracts per hour for <coughs> a legal, 0.5 contracts per hour for a tax lawyer, and one contract per hour for the senior partner. Okay? And so if I want to know the effective capacity of a resource pool per day, right, I'm going to take the, effect, the effective capacity of that resource unit, right, times the number of professionals, sorry, times the number of professionals, times the number of hours that they are available to work on that per day. So, and I'm going to go ahead and freeze pane so we can see those labels. So basically then what we're saying is our paralegal can do, um, that pool of paralegals can do 4.8 per day. Our tax lawyers is 0.5 times 3 times 8, can do 12 a day, right? And our senior partners can do 8 a day, okay? And it again tells us that we're going to assume that there are 20 days in a month. So if I want monthly capacity, I'm going to take that times the 20 days in a month. Okay, so it tells us 96, 240, and 160. So what's our bottleneck resource here? Rachel, what's our bottleneck resource? The paralegal. The paralegal, right? Okay, so um, the first question says, what is the effective capacity of the process in terms of contracts per day? We calculated that. Then the question is, can the company process all 150 cases in November? Okay, Courtney, can they process all 150 in November? For the paralegal. So just in terms of can this firm contract all 150 in November? Excuse me, is that what they? Yeah, they have a, they get 150 coming in. Are they going to be able to process all of them? Yes. Yes, Zach. No. I said no. You say no. Why do you say no? Um, because of the paralegals. Capacity. Right. 
So the paralegals are the bottleneck, right? So they can only get 96 through them, and they have to go through the paralegals to get to the rest of them. So if your paralegals can only do 96, that's all your process can do, okay? And so the answer is no, okay? And then if the firm wishes to process all 150 cases available, how many professionals of each type are needed? Okay, Spencer, if I need to answer that, how am I going to answer that? Uh, not entirely sure. Okay. All right. So basically we're going to say that we want 150 contracts, right, coming through each area, okay. right? And so then I need to know, okay, well, what's my effective capacity? How many contracts can they actually do? Not sure why that disappeared on me. So my effective capacity is 0.2, right? For a paralegal, it's 0.5 and 1, okay? All right. Then the question is, how many hours do I need per month, okay? Well, I know that I want to do 150 total contracts, right? And my contracts per hour are 0.2 contracts per hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 150 divide by 0 .2. and divide it by 0.2. And that's going to tell me that I need 750 paralegal hours, okay, for the month to do 150 contracts. And I need 300 tax lawyer hours, and I need 150 senior partner hours. But these folks are not available eight hours a day, right? They're only available so for a partial number of days. So then we have to come back and have to say, well, a paralegal is only available for six, right? And a tax lawyer for eight, and a senior partner for four. So then to get how many of those I need, I take the hours needed to complete those contracts divided by the hours that one of those would be available, right? And so it tells me that I need, sorry, I did something wrong there. Oh, yeah. Because how many days in the month do we have, right? So I need to divide by 20 as well. Okay, so it's going to be... I need 300 hours in the month, right, divided by, they're available eight hours per day, but that 300 is split across 20 days, so I need 1.875 tax lawyers, right, and I need 1.875 senior partners, okay. So, again, we talked about unit load and um, effective capacity, right, and then now that the next level is what can you do with that information? So when people ask you those questions, how do you figure out how many resources do you need, right? How do you figure out, well, what if I've got two different types of resources, okay? So again, that, that covers 5.1. 5.2 says, reconsider the law firm and exercise 5.1 and assume the prevailing revenues per shopping and medical facility, right, are... Uh, four thousand and five thousand dollars per project. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and bring up five two. Right, I've got my revenues at four thousand per project for the shopping and five thousand per project for the medical. Okay, and that out of pocket expenses associated with each project are negligible, meaning that you have we're going to assume that we have no variable costs. Okay, the fixed cost of operating is five hundred thousand dollars. What type of project is the most profitable? Okay. Well, you can no longer, this is where we tend to want to think linearly when we work on stuff, right? We went from doing individuals to combining it up to do an artificial. Well, now it's asking us which type of project, so we have to go back to doing the individual uh, information. So individually, if we look at the shopping center, our effective capacity, again, is the inverse. So it's 1 divided by 4. Right? 1 divided by 1, 1 divided by 1, okay? We know that we have uh, 4, 3 and 2. Why do I say that? Yeah, because it comes from the problem. We have 4 uh, paralegals, 3 tax lawyers, and 2 senior partners, right? And they are available for 6, 8, and 4 respectively. So effective capacity of a resource pool in terms of contracts per day. Again, the same thing that we've been doing um, since last Thursday. We're just adding in that they're not available for a full day at this point. And then to get to our monthly capacity, 
we take it times 20. And so I'm going to repeat that, and because I'm in Excel, I can just copy and paste all of my formulas, I think. And that's going to give us monthly capacity of 80, 160, and 160 for the unit medical load. <laughs> so if I were you, I'd follow along, just follow along with this, and then I'll post the, the um, solutions when we're done. But make sure that you're tracking with when we're asked to think about um, which is the most profitable, right? You can't keep them combined anymore. You have to break them apart and you have to look at them individually, okay? So when we say, well, what project is most profitable, <clears throat> right? That's our question. Profitable. So when we think about our profitability, it's going to be our unit contribution margin. times our effective capacity. Yes, I want that to be a name. Okay. And so for our shopping center, and our medical center, right, we know that our contribution margin, because we said that our variable costs were neg negligible, are going to be 4,000 per contract and 5,000 per contract, okay? So then our daily profitability, how do I determine my daily profitability for the shopping? I think, Andrew, I'm probably to you. Um, so this is so all you, of our you shopping. You take your revenues minus your fixed costs. So, so I, say, say that to me again. Your revenues minus your fixed costs. Okay. So the, the piece that the component that you're missing there is when we talk about unit contribution margin, we're ignoring fixed costs. And so sometimes what you're going to find in this textbook, they give you extra information just to make sure that you're thinking, okay? And so that and that you're understanding what unit contribution margin is. So unit contribution margin is your revenues minus your variable costs. And what they tell us in the problem is our variable costs are negligible. So we're going to just pretend like they're zero. So we've already got our contribution margin. We're going to say it's 4,000 per shopping uh, contract. Okay. So if it's 4,000 per shopping contract and I want to know what my profitability can be per day, what am I going to do? Well, the contracts. Yeah. I'm going to take that times what? Uh, the amount. Capacity that I can yeah. do. Yeah. Okay. And so, what is that from from my shopping? What's the most that I can do in a day? One twenty. Yes, you're exactly right. Okay. Because oh, that's monthly. Oh, you're right. So daily would be six, right? You would still, if, you're, if we did month to month, we'd get the same answer, but you're right. It's asking us per day, okay? So then, um, Emily, for the medical, what am I going to do? Um, you're going to do the 5,000 um, times 24. Okay, so the medical's over here. Oh, four. Yep. Sorry. Because it's got to be the lowest amount, right? Yeah. I'm not sure why we want to keep, okay. So that being said, one on one it doesn't do that. What's that? One that you had loaded is different. It looks <coughs> like. Like times 180 and times 80. So basically, it's doing it by the month. Yeah. Right. But I think the, I think if we, I think I asked the question in terms of a day. So, all right. So, um, we're so basically saying which one is more profitable then, Scotty? Which one is shopping? More, shopping is more profitable for us, right? And but again, it's that same thing. If you look at the unit contribution margin you'd make a poor decision if you said, well, we need to be doing more of the medical contracts because that's more, our contribution margin is greater there. But that's not true because it takes you longer to do those. Okay? <coughs> right. And then
And then and the next question is, at the current product mix, which is 50-50, how much contribution margin is generated? Okay. So at the current product mix, how much contribution margin is generated? Okay, so how do you think you'd go about figuring that? Anybody have any ideas? Divide it by fifty. Your twenty-four thousand divided by two. Mm -hmm. Or multiply it by fifty percent, right? Because you yeah. take, yeah, it's the same exact. You're right, Hunter. What you're doing is you're going to take a weighted average of what your um, uh, could, what your contribution mar margins are given the full day. Okay, so it's going to be. Yeah. Um, so my weighted average is going to be twenty-four thousand times 0.5, right? Plus twenty thousand times 0.5. Right? And if I sum that up, it's going to tell me that my contribution margin per day is going to be 22,000 because I'm going to get 50% of one product, 50% of the other product. Right? And there we have it. Okay? All right. Then it says, at the current product mix, or what is the profit at capacity? Okay? So we know, what do we know about our daily profit right now? How much is that? What's our contribution margin generated per day? Let me help. Let me just calculate that. Yeah, it'd be 22,000. Right? So at the current product mix, we have um, 22,000 um, per day. Okay. So basically what we're saying is what's our current, and in order to figure that, right, we have to go back to here where we combine up our current product mix. Sorry, I did that on the wrong screen. To go back to where we've combined them up and we've looked at our current product mix and how what's our bottleneck? Paralegal, and so we can do 96 a day. So if I can do 96 a day, 48 of those are going to be shopping, right? And 48 of those are going to be medical. Everybody on board with that? Okay. And my contribution margin is 4,000 and 5,000. Per contract, right? And so then my monthly contribution margin at this mix is going to be 4,000 times 48 and 5,000 times 48. Okay, so 432,000 monthly. And if I wanted to say daily, I would just divide that back by 20, right, to get 21,600. So you're starting to get into the, you know, it's the, to me, you're starting to get into kind of some of that MBA stuff, where it's not just enough to know this one piece of information. It's how are you going to apply <coughs> the pieces of information that you should know, right? And so it's understanding what contribution margin is, 
and it's understanding how that applies when you need to look at it as a combined unit load, right? Whenever they're asking you at the current product mix, you're talking about using that artificial unit load. And whenever they're asking you about um, the, um, sorry, I got distracted for a second. We started at 9.30, right? So we go till 10.45? All right. so, or 10:30 if you want. What's <laughs> so 10:30 if you want. Um, Got three and so, today. so basically, first. you just have to be thinking about what is the question asking you, and what pieces of information do you know, and how how are you going to pull those together to be able to to answer that. Okay. Um, and so then D says, at the current product mix, what's the value of hiring a paralegal? Okay. So one of the things that you can do is I can take an artificial. So I'll just type the question D to be consistent. So at the current project, current product mix, what is the value of hiring a paralegal? So I'll give you a little bit of a clue. What I would do is I would say, well, if it's a 50-50, right, I'm going to go, my contribution margin is 4,000 plus 5,000. And if I take the average of that, right, my artificial contribution margin is equal to 4,500. So I can think about then with this current product mix, if I add one more contract, that's going to give me an extra $4,500. So how would I determine how many contracts one paralegal could add, right? And I'm at, <coughs> again, do you, we're saying at the current product mix, so I kind of need to think about Okay, let's look at this table, right? Because that's at the current product mix. How would we figure that out? Any ideas? So what question do I really need to be asking? So I know what my contribution margin is. So what else? So if I want to know what the value of a paralegal is, what do I need to know? That would be the overall contribution of being able to get more units done per day. Okay, so I'd be able to get more units done per day. So I know what my contribution margin is per unit. So what, do I need, what else do I need to figure out then? So you're, you're on the right track. For both of them. For both, well, it's, I'm just saying if I add one paralegal, right? So if I add one paralegal and I need to know how much value that brings, I need to know how many contracts a paralegal is going to be able to, adding one paralegal would be able to do, right? Okay. And so in order to do that, right, I have to use my artificial unit load because we're talking about they're doing both types of products. So we're back over to the uh, 5.1, right? And we're saying that a paralegal effective capacity is 0.2 contracts per hour. Okay, and I'm just tempted to do this. We don't need all that, but I think what I can do is if I copy this over, okay, and if I said, well, what if I only had one professional, right? Wouldn't that tell me how many contracts a paralegal could do? Okay, so if I do that and a paralegal can do 1.2 contracts per day, Okay, then that tells me that the contribution margin per day of a paralegal is going to be $5,400, and the contribution margin per month is going to be 5,400 times 20, right? So $108,000. So again, artificial contribution margin, uh, contracts per day, right? Uh, contribution margin per day, and contribution margin per month. Sometimes the questions that you're going to be asked aren't going to be about really reinventing the wheel. It's just trying to figure out with the information you have, how can you answer that question. All right. So that was D on 5.2. All right. 
Then let's take a look at 5, 3. Okay. And 5, 3 says, uh, three hairstylists, Francois, Bernard, and Mimi run fast service hair salon for busy professionals in the Gold Coast area of downtown Chicago. Okay. So, and it says C figure 5, 1. So that's, and it just shows them basically in a linear process. Okay. And it says that they stay open from 6.45 a.m. to 9 p.m. in order to accommodate as many people's work schedules as possible. They perform only shampooing and hairstyling activities. On average, it takes 10 minutes to shampoo, 15 minutes to style the hair, and 5 minutes to build the customer. When a customer arrives, he or she first checks in with the receptionist, Bernard's younger sister, Lulu. This takes only 3 minutes. One of the three stylists then takes charge of the customer and performs all three activities, shampooing, styling, and billing consecutively. Okay. So basically, what I do is I kind of, I started out kind of drawing the process and then had to just correct it a little bit because when I found out Lulu's in there for an extra three minutes, right? All right. So if I were to set this up, right, it's a linear process. So how many unit, how many types of units do we have? Do we have multiple things going on or do we just have kind of one type of unit? Two, don't you? You have, so, so don't confuse resource pools and units, right? Because we have two resource pools. We have the receptionists and we have the stylists, okay? But they're basically, they're saying they only do one type of thing. They only, well, they only cut, do a haircut or whatever. So, so basically, Lulu meets the customer, then the customer goes to a stylist, right? And that stylist is going to shampoo style, and then they're going to build. So that's all just lumped into one now. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. Right. And so I, again, set them up the same way every time, right? And we've said that we've got a receptionist and we have stylist, right? And we said minutes per customer. So the receptionist does both the greeting and the billing. So how much time for the receptionist per customer? Right now, the receptionist is only doing the receptionist. The, the billing's included with the stylist. OK. Shampooing, styling, billing. OK, so all right, so the receptionist takes three minutes. And the stylist then takes the remainder of that 30 minutes, right? So that if I need to go to, um, if I want to convert from, again, minutes to hours, right, to make sure that I'm talking about things in a consistent format, I'm going to take my three minutes per customer, and I'm going to go um, three minutes per customer times Sixty minutes. Would it be times sixty to make it an hour? Okay, so three minutes per customer. Okay. So you tell me, three minutes per customer times what? Sixty minutes. You think? So I'm trying to get to hours per customer. <coughs> times the amount of customers. All I'm trying to do here is just convert my unit load into hours per customer, right? I'm in minutes per customer. I need to go to hours per customer, okay? So if it takes three minutes per customer, 0.05. Here's how you do that. It's back to your algebra, right? It's three, sorry, you're going to go three minutes, right, over your customer. And then you're going to multiply that times, and if you're trying to get to hours, right, it's one hour per 60 minutes. So you're going to divide. Point zero five. So I'm going to go 3 divided by 60, right, and 30 divided by 60. Is your thing that you put up right because it says unit load is 8 and 25? That's, 
I, that's moving on to the second part of the problem. Okay. Okay. So for this part, of, for the first part of the problem, um, we've got three minutes per customer from the receptionist standpoint and 30 minutes per customer from the stylist standpoint. We change that to hours per customer, right? And now to get to effective capacity, what am I doing? Inverse. Inverse, right? So 1 over 0.5 and 1 over point. 1, 1, 1 over 0 0.05 and 1 over 0 0.5 says that the receptionist can do 20 customers per hour and the stylist can do two customers per hour. Okay, We have one resource unit from the stylist standpoint and three from the, from the, one from the receptionist, three from the stylist, right? And they're all available for 14.25 minutes a long day, isn't it? 14.25 hours. So the effective capacity of that resource pool, again, this is exactly what we've been doing. The only difference here is that we figured we just transitioned unit load, right? Okay, so it's going to be equal to the effective capacity of the resource unit times the number of resources times the number of hours that they're available in a day. Okay, so that tells us that our receptionist can do 285, right, and that our stylist can do 85.5. Okay, and so um, What's the number of customers that can be serviced per hour in this hair salon? 85. 85.5. Okay. A customer, a fast service hair salon, an operations specialist has suggested that the billing operation be transferred to Lulu. So this is where we go. Okay, well, the billing takes five minutes. So I'm going to change Lulu to eight minutes, and I'm going to reduce the stylus to 25 minutes, right? There's the beauty of doing it in Excel, right? It automatically recalculates everything. What would be the impact on the theoretical capacity? Okay, well, we had 85 before, and what are we at now? 102.6, right? So it, in, it increased from 85 to 102.6, all right? So, Hunter, that's what you're seeing is when we, yeah, end, when the, we end it by making okay, that. Yeah, that was the last question. Yeah, right. that's the last question, and we just revised this. Probably what I should do is do it like this, but it's so quick to do it just, right? So if I did A here, and we left that at 3 and 30, right? That's probably how it should show it. Okay, so that was 5.3. Um, 5.4 says, a company makes two products, A and B, using a single resource pool. The resource is available for 900 minutes per day. The contribution margins for A and B are $20 and $35 per unit, respectively. The unit loads are 10 and 20 minutes per unit. So which product is more profitable? Okay. So I'm just going to ask you, generically speaking, what do I need to do to start with? Am I looking at individual unit loads or an artificial unit load? Because it's asking me about individual. It's asking me about the contribution margin per each, right? Okay. So it says, which product is more profitable? <coughs> OK, so we've got product A, we've got product B. We've got that we have um, resources um, that our unit loads are 10 uh, and 20 minutes per unit for product 10 for product A, 20 for product B. Right? Their contribution margin is 20 and 35. Okay, uh, <clears throat> So which product is more profitable? We need to understand how many we can do. Right, So what our effective capacity is. So it's 1 divided by 10. Right, And our effect effective capacity for product B is 1 divided by 20. Okay, So then if I were going to do uh, profitability, sometimes spelled that way. I could do 20 times 0.1 in a minute. And let's go ahead and give us a couple of extra decimal places. And 35 times 0 0.5, 0 0.05. Scotty? Is the contribution margin on there, is that per unit? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
right? So profitability wise, even though the contribution margin of product A is less per unit because of the amount of time that it takes, it's actually the more profitable of the two, okay? Um, and then part B of that says, the company wishes to produce a mix of 60% A's and 40% B's. So what is the effective capacity of the units per day? So now what do I need to do? Somebody else, what do I need to do? We did the individuals, right? Am I at individual or artificial? Artificial. Artificial, right? Okay, so B says the company wishes, sometimes spelled wishes, to produce a mix of 60% A's and 40% B's. What is the effective capacity? And again, you'll just see me again and again come back to that same table. Okay, and I'm going to go product A. Product B, and I've got 10 units, 10 minutes per unit for product A, 20 minutes per unit for product B, right? My product mix is 60% A's and 40% B's, right? And so I'm going to go to get my artificial unit load, it's going to be 10 times 60% plus 20 times 40%. Right? So that tells me that my artificial unit load is 14. Effective capacity is the inverse of my unit load. So 1 over 14 gives me 0 0.07 units per minute. My resource availability is 900 minutes per day. So then I'm going to say that my effective capacity of the resource pool is going to be 0.7 times 900 should give me 64.285 in terms of my effective capacity. Okay, so I know that you're having, I know that this is not the most exciting stuff you've ever seen, but I also don't want to dump you into these kinds of problems without having walked you through some of it first so that you know what you need to be looking for. Okay, and so the types of homework that you're going to see and the types of test questions that you're going to see are going to relate back to. You know, how do you put this information together and answer those series of questions? Hunter. Okay, so I was looking and the next test is only 150 points. So is there something like chopped off of there for the next test? Like are we not having the vocab part or is it just like all scaled down? It, it's just, there's two chapters. So that's why, right? Okay, your instead first, of four. Yeah, your first test was four chapters. This one's two chapters. So that's why. Okay. So roughly 75 points per chapter then. Okay. So no, it'll still be vocab, it'll still be problems, okay? Would it still be about the same amount of questions, or is it, I mean, is it less? I'll tell you after I finish writing it, okay? You can just send a copy via yeah. email, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, that'd be make it easier for everybody, right? Yeah. <clears throat> be easy to grade, too. Like, when you do well in a test, it's really easy for me to grade. So I'm always, like, encour I'm, I'm always wanting you to do well, too, for a variety of reasons. Oh, but great that, inflation. That is a selfish one for me. Okay, so then um, we know then... Let's keep going here. So at, at the indicated product mix, what's the financial capacity or profit per day? Okay, so we're given that we have a contribution margin of twenty unit or twenty dollars per unit, and I think thirty five, right? Yes. Thirty five. Okay. So if that's our contribution margin, how would I figure out, given this information, how would I figure out what my profitability per day is going to be? Say that again? You have to do the weighted. I take a weighted contribution margin, and then what do I do with it? So it's still going to be 20 times 0.60 plus 35 times 0.40. So that's my artificial contribution margin. So for every unit, every artificial unit that I do, right, it's $26. So how many artificial units am I doing in a day? 
64.285, right? So then I can go this times this, right? <coughs> it tells me that it, my uh, profit is going to be $1,671.43. Okay? All right. I know this is going to break your heart, but this will be the last problem we'll do today. I'm going to do problem 5-5, five, five, and it's a pretty straightforward one. It says, an insurance company processes two types of claims, life and property. The capacity of processing life claims is 500 per month. The capacity of processing property claims is 1,000 per month. Assuming a common bottleneck, what is the capacity of a processing mix of 50-50 of the two types? Okay. So, let's do... So if I'm looking for the capacity of the two types, right? I can do life claims per month. I can do 500, right? Property claims per month. I can do 1,000. I really don't want that to be percent. Okay. <clears throat> and it's a 50-50 split. How many? How am I going to figure it? My product was about 50 and a month. Yep. Taking that weighted average, right? I did use when I was uh, when What's I was the in. Percent returns you want on investment, right there. What's that? So that'd be the percent returns you want on investment. Uh -huh. That month. what I, when I was at Pella, I did a lot of <coughs> weighted averages. I mean, I just think they're a concept that comes in handy when you're trying to. When you, have a, when you have a large amount of information or, and you have to figure out, well, how can I best represent that so that people can understand? Because um, right now we're only doing, you know, two different types, right? But if you think about, you know, the more complex it gets, you can give a weighted average and you can say what your assumptions are and people can move forward with that, right? So go back and put my head around that and we can move forward with it. So, again, that's just kind of a, um, a run through of the first uh, problems in the chapter. We'll do a little bit more lecture on Thursday, do a few different types of problems. I think there's just a handful that we're going to touch bases on and answer, go through some discussion questions, and then we'll come back next Tuesday and do the exam review, okay? Um, I wouldn't wait too long to work on the problems from this, though, right? You'd probably be better off to turn around. I say that frequently, but it's still whatever works, all right? All right, you guys have a good day. I'll see you back here on Thursday.